this is oh, the <laughs> Hello, my friends, and welcome to a very special edition of Running with Ryan. Today, I'm running with a true legend. This man is one of the most decorated runners of all time. He's the only American man ever to win a gold medal at the Olympics in the marathon distance. He pretty much started the running boom along with some others back in the 70s. He made running cool. He led the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency for years. He started, along with another man, Steve Bosley, the Boulder Boulder here in Boulder, Colorado, my favorite race of the year. And he's also the father of one of my best friends. When I was a little kid, I got to see that gold medal of his and it inspired me to become a runner. He just had surgery, so he's actually not gonna be running today. We're gonna be walking. Ladies and gentlemen, make some noise out there for legendary Frank Shorter. Yeah! All right, here we are. Frank, how you doing, buddy? Ah, doing pretty well. Good to see you, my great friend. Day. That's On a great day. On the trail out the back door. That's right, this That's... is our neighborhood. That's right. We are pretty lucky to live here. You sure are. Anyway, I'd like you to notice that I'm wearing Frank Shorter brand jacket that I got almost 20 years ago in college when I was modeling for your the Japanese catalog back yeah, in the day. Yeah, that, that, the word's out. You were modeling. He was modeling. <laughs> All right, so let's get started kind of from the beginning. People are going to be curious about how you became one of the best runners of all time. Were you a runner as a kid? Did it happen in high school? How did this all start? It started actually as stress relief when I was about 10 years old living in a little town of 22,000 people in upstate New York and by the way for those of us from upstate New York that's anything north of the George Washington Bridge there you go it's not New York City <laughs> and I started to run to and from school a couple three times a week and carry my books yeah and as an aside one of the interesting things if you look in footage of me running I hold this one hand almost still in this other hand I move because this is where I carry my books. Oh, no way. Yeah, no backpack. So, uh, so you figured out a way to run while holding books. Holding my stack of books. I love it. I when did you realize that, oh, I'm actually pretty good at this, and this I like the competitive part of running? Well, you know, this comes around to sort of the vagaries of life, just what happens. My mother, in order, I think, to try to save me from the home situation, which was very abusive, Yeah. I was sent to a prep school in Massachusetts called Mount Hermon. It's now known as Northfield Mount Hermon. Okay. And I arrived my sophomore year in high school, and it turned out that this school had a cross country team that were the perennial New England prep school champions. Okay. Every year they would win, pretty much, they would win the New England championship. So that year, they also, at that school, that had been founded by an evangelist named Dwight Moody in the 1890s, he instituted a school-wide cross-country race. Huh. He was from England, so he brought over cross-country in the 1890s wow. from England, and it was a 4.3-mile race every year before Thanksgiving vacation. Okay. And if you finish this 4.3 mile race, I think it was under 33 minutes, you got a whole pie. Oh really? Any, yeah. any flavor you want? Uh, no, it was always apple. Apple pie, okay. It was an apple pie. <laughs> That's a good prize, as yeah, far as yeah. prizes go. And it was called the pie race. Okay. And that race was, and still is, the oldest continuously run foot race in the United States. Wow, that's a cool story. It predates the Boston Marathon by four years. Wow. And that sophomore, uh, junior year, I was second in the All New England Championships. And the fellow finished ahead of me was my teammate. Wow. Uh, who was a senior who had won the race the year before and was repeating. Okay. And so, so you were 15 at this time or something? Oh, about 16. 16? Yeah, wow, okay. 16. Senior year, I set a course record on every cross-country course I ran. Nice. 
with, you know, at all the New England prep schools, yeah. Andover, Exeter, St. Paul's, Groton, Middlesex, yeah, yeah. Choate, and won the New England championship. So that was it. Yeah. Went to college, ran for stress relief in college. I was a pre-med. Yeah. Senior year. I'm one of those people that don't get mad at me. <laughs> I won't, I promise. By, by spring break of my senior year, I basically finished all my requirements to graduate. Oh, nice. So all you had to do was focus on running. And for three months, I focused on running. Ran twice a day for the first time for maybe, uh, oh, maybe two or three times a week. Probably three. Okay. And went to the NCAA championships and won the six mile. It was six miles rather than 10,000 meters. Okay. On a Friday and the next day I finished second in the 5,000. Wow. In the three mile. So, and it just kept going up. I think I was always realistic about really knowing how good I was and the way I put it is what pond I was in. Okay. You know, and as you get better and better, you move up and move on to different ponds. Totally. And so, once I did well in the NCAAs and went to the Nationals and made my first international team where I met Steve Prefontaine yeah. and Kenny Moore and we all roomed together and wow. trained together. That is just legendary. That but even then, I think I was very realistic about how good I was. So. Yeah. I always had in the back of my mind, I may get there, but really the attitude I always took was, let's just find out where this goes. Okay. In, in other words, yeah. how good can I get? Yeah. And I knew I was going to level off. And it was just a question of where. Yeah. So I was always ready. I know this may sound strange, but I was always ready to be able to acknowledge when I'd leveled off. Okay. Well, I think I think what it was also, I was my own coach. Okay. After the Olympics, my coach in, at Yale said to me when I described how I trained after graduation yeah. to run, he, he interrupted me and he said, you know, you've been making up your own workouts yeah. from the middle of your junior year. Wow. I was self-coached. Yeah. And maybe that's why I had a little bit different Perspective. In other words, I, yeah. I could kind of sense when I was improving. So you make the Olympic team for the Munich Olympics, and you must have known, okay, my times are up there with some of the best in the world. I'm, you know, I have a good chance at this, right? I could, I, be, I could I be a gold medalist. In any way, I, I was a realist, but the, yeah. the way I've always thought of the marathon, ever since my first one, I ran the first one in uh, 70, and after that, my first Fukuoka, in 1971, which, and that used to be the world championships, because okay. that's when the runners from the East, yeah. Eastern Bloc would venture out to race. And it was the only time that you could really do that okay. and race against the entire world. Wow, all right. Because other, other than that, they stayed home. So, yeah. but I developed a theory very early on, and I don't know exactly when, but it was. In any major race, like that at, at the world-class level, you know, Olympic level. Basically, there are going to be 10 people that are going to show up. And don't ask me why I came up with the number 10. <laughs> yeah. Who have the potential to win. Okay. And three are going to have prepared in a way and timed it so that they have a good day. Yes. Only 30%, only three out of 10 are really going to have a good day. Yeah. And so many other so things my, can happen. You know, and my goal was to work in a way that would make me one of those three. Okay. And then the other part of that was I never went into the race thinking, well, I'm going to win this. Yeah. It was if I've done this right and I have a good day, yeah. I can be in the top three. Wow, okay. And then let's see what happens. Right? Again, yeah. getting back to that. Okay, let's find out. Yeah. That's fun. Yeah. And so, you know, you're coming into the stadium in Munich. <laughs> At the time, you don't know that an imposter has run into right. the stadium and kind of blown your cover. Right. The crowd thinks he's the winner. You right. know he's not. That is an imposter. Get him off the track. This happens in Bush League marathons. We can't have an Olympic marathon. marathon. This looks like a fake. 
week in the Olympic Games. They ought to throw him out. Get rid of that guy. What was that like? Well, I heard the cheer outside just as I was entering the tunnel. There yeah. was this huge cheer. And again, the way my mind works, <laughs> track and field, it was the, one of the, the last time, I think, uh, that the marathon was not on closing ceremonies day. Okay. But it was on the last day of track and field. And I thought, eh, ah, yeah. you know, maybe the high jump is still going on <laughs> if someone made a height. <laughs> yeah. So I go down, I run out onto the track, and it's silent. <laughs> You're like, hey guys, what about me? It's, I just, <laughs> just and, won the marathon. <laughs> and, and, the, and the thought that went through my mind really was, it is, yeah. it was, geez, I'm an American, but give me a break. <laughs> it, it was, you know, because at the time Americans, yeah, we could win the shorter distance events, but we weren't yeah. endurance people. Yeah. started into the first turn past the finish line and people started whistling. Well, okay. in Europe, whistling is booing. Yeah, absolutely. And so I thought, whoa. And <laughs> it's kind of a cold audience. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Huh? And got on the back stretch and right up against the uh, stands, someone was one of the first rows, yells out in this <laughs> American accent, I'll never forget. He said, don't worry, Frank. And I said to myself, why should I worry? I'm winning. Yeah, you're like, this is great. This is the I'm biggest day of my life. I'm winning. <laughs> yeah. And then when I started around the last turn towards the finish line, I looked towards the finish and there was something going on. Yeah. So I crossed the finish line and stopped to untie and take my shoes off. And someone came up to me and said, and these were the words, what did you think about that guy? What did you think of that guy? <laughs> and you're still clueless. No, I knew. Oh, you right knew then now, I knew. okay. <laughs> I knew what had happened. Okay. And, you know, again, you, you talk about certain moments in time. Um, in a way, people remembered the race perhaps more yeah. because of that. And then the other thing that, I realized very quickly, I was much less upset than people who saw it. Yeah. And people would still, for years, people would come up to me and said, I was so mad at that guy, I wanted to kick in a yeah. television set. Was, you know, it was a 17 year old high school student. Oh, it was? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So he, it's the equivalent of like a high school football streaker. He's just goofing yeah. around, right? Yeah. And he had a buddy who had been driving a golf cart servicing the pop stands <laughs> around the track and field venue, around yeah, the stadium. Okay. So that's how he got through security. <laughs> he jumped on the back of the golf cart. Wow. So, and the other thing I realized, and I can honestly know, because it happened to me, yeah. was that I didn't run for that cheer. Yeah. That wasn't one of the goals. Okay. It wasn't for the recognition in the stadium it was to try to win the race. Yeah. And you did. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's a fascinating story. Whether Frank thinks he lost or not, I have no idea. He may think that that other guy took a complete victory lap and then left the stadium, whereas the man never came to the finish line. So Frank, when I was younger, I wanted to be like you. I wanted to be an Olympic champion. That didn't happen. I wasn't even close. But in the last five years, I've gotten into ultra running. What do you think about ultras? Because back when you were running marathons, that seemed impossibly far to people. It, now people are running 100, 200 mile races. And I, I think it's great because I also like to think part of my good fortune was being blessed with a body that was suited to the marathon distance. Yeah. And I don't think my body is suited to ultra. Okay. In my experience over time, and I've, I, I covered the ultras, um, uh, you know, the Western States 100. Oh, you did? Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> did an NBC in the early 80s. Oh, okay. And um, actually, during the telecast, we do it at certain points, and I run, ran part of the course, and I, in that 24 hour period, and I actually wrote a <laughs> part of one of the forwards to the Western States 100 book. Okay. Because the most miles I ever ran in a, tw I've ever run in a 24 mile hour period. I ran while covering the Western <laughs> States. I would run parts 
of it yeah. to the next, say, telecast point. And I really got a, a very, you know, good feel for it. And I knew it was legitimate because the winner that year turned out to be a guy who worked for me. Oh, wow. Had worked for me. Okay. His name was Skip Hamilton. Oh, wow. Who won the race several times. So I knew what it took. But I also knew his body type. Yeah. And my theory, and I don't, and again, it's just my theory, <laughs> yep. it's a different body type. It's a heavier body type. And I think it's people, and again, it's not empirical, it's just yeah. my thought. I think ultra marathon runners are better fat metabolizers. Okay, yeah. And I think they have an ability to digest and get nutrients into their body. Yeah. Faster. Well, yeah, I, mean, I do. I do. You, have, you eat so much during you a do. long course of and a race. I couldn't imagine doing that. Yeah. And um, and the other part of it that I've always loved about the ultras is the equality. Yes. I think the longer the distance gets, the closer to gender equality, and then sometimes even over. And even back when I was in the 80s. And Tracen. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. And Tracen. And to watch her compete against the men, um, man, I'll tell you, <laughs> I get goosebumps. I, I think if I were in an ultra, the last person I would want to see when I turned around to find there would be Ann Tracen. There would even be another man. She's going to get me. Yeah. She's going to get me. But the other thing that I found, and probably why I never did it, was that I, or maybe it's just a rationalization, yeah. but I love training. Yes. And I don't like backing off and resting. Mm. And I don't like recovery time. Yeah. So I only ran three or four hard races a year where yeah. I really backed off yep. and it would be one or two marathons and maybe one or two five and 10,000 meter runs. Yeah. And so I think really part of it was I didn't t want to take the way away from training. Yeah, yeah. To <laughs> to get ready for an ultra. Yep. Because I enjoyed training. Yeah. I mean that was again, and this goes right back to why did I get into the running for the stress relief, for yeah. the you know for the good feeling of training and having a session and getting done and going. That was right. Yeah. That was ju just like in the Olympics. That yeah. was right. That was just enough for today. Yeah. I remember you, I think in high school, you came and talked to us. You said for every mile you race, you take a day off or something. Relatively easier day. Yeah, relatively. So I run 100 miles. I have 100 and days off. <laughs> you, see, you see, for me, going 50 days of not yeah. training as much as I would want to, I didn't want to do that. Yeah, yeah. So in a way it was kind of, well, it wasn't yeah. selfish, it's just it my just, personality. It, yeah, absolutely. Let's talk about something that was just very sad, but also a coincidence in your life. You were in Munich when the terrorists came in and kidnapped the Israeli athletes. And murdered. And, you, and murdered, yes. And you were also in Boston during the bombings. Right. I was sleeping on the balcony in Munich because Dave Waddle had his new wife in our room. In <laughs> And they didn't want to share. <laughs> and so you slept on the balcony on the in the balcony. Olympic Village. There was an over There was an overhang. <laughs> okay, that's good. So but and so I heard the shots. Wow. And I knew because I'd been out there for a few days, and I said, "That's not a door slamming. Yeah. That's gunfire. Yeah. And so yeah, I was there for all of that. Ugh. And, what a dark time. And you know the delaying. But again, what you learn. Thank you. What you learn, again, in a way it's good to know how you would react because you know how you reacted. Yeah, yeah. And our first reaction in Munich was, people died, we're all going home. Yeah. Nothing, nothing is worth human life. No, nothing. Just being sacrificed. Yeah. And then over time, two or three days, that experience was where we could find out that we went through all those stages you go through when you know you're in a traumatic event and usually it can take you know months 
we did it in days. Wow, yeah. And that's when I get back to the reframing. Mm -hmm. The idea, there you are, because, and by the time we got back from the memorial service, uh, the next day, or, and, um, well, it, it was over the course of two days. Yeah. We realized that no, because if we don't compete, then we're just giving in and doing what the terrorists wanted. Yeah, that's and, true. And that was the first international act of terrorism on that scale. Yeah. So 2013, whew, I'm doing the Boston Marathon coverage. Oh, and just to finish the story, yeah. I was talking with Kenny Moore on the way back after the memorial service in the Olympic Village, and I said, you know, Ken, the only place that the terrorists, these people can do anything more at the Olympics it's going to be on the marathon course. Oh, wow. If they're going to do anything. Huh. And I said to Just him... Just because there's so many people? Well, like, yeah, or, yeah. How are they going to frisk everybody? Wow. And I said, you know, again, I'm not going to think about it. Hmm. Because if I do, yeah. they win. Yeah. And I ran the entire Munich Marathon and never thought about it once. Wow. Never thought. So... 2013, huh. I'm on my way to a production meeting just before 3 o'clock in the afternoon and they're still finishing the race. And I was, oh, about 100 yards from the finish and it was crowded and I yeah. couldn't get through on the street. So there was a store and it turned out it was the store that had the video camera that took a pictures of the first bomb and I was right across the street didn't know wow. where the first bomb was went into the vestibule the first room and uh, bomb one went off right behind me oh, so you were really close I was up right across the street oh. but I was inside I had just gone through one door okay but I'll never forget huh, my signal that no one was moving ahead of me yeah. was about where that white truck is. Okay. There was a guy carrying about 20 feet. There was a guy carrying his child on his shoulders. Wow. And when that bomb went off, my first thought was about that child, that kid. Oh. And what, Oof. what? Yeah. And I also knew people were going to be coming in behind me. Yeah. Oh. So I went through the store and, um, uh, oh, bomb two went off, and we went down to where our broadcast position was, which was right near the finish line, and watched all the triage Oof. of people coming in, and I'll never forget, it was about from here to my house there. Yeah. And that's where the finish line was, yeah. and they were wheeling someone over in a wheelchair. And as soon as it got close enough, I could see that this person had no legs. Oh. And I, and I, <laughs> and, and, uh, you know, we just, we just uh, dealt with it. Yeah. But okay, here's. Again, why things happen for a reason. September 13th, same year. I'm on, getting on a plane to fly back to Boston from Denver yeah. to run a fundraiser at Suffolk Downs with Billy Rogers <laughs> to raise money for Boston Strong. Yeah. Otherwise, I would not have been getting on that plane. Yeah. In line, I started to talk to someone who is now my wife, Michelle. Really? Yes. I didn't know that story. Yes. Wow. What brought you here? Why are you still here? And what do you love most about Boulder? Um, what I love most about it is being able to simply go out your door and run. Yeah. And also have access to facilities to do the speed training there's yep. there's still a way to do it yep. when I first got here it was very easy uh, to find a track and you know have access yeah 
in the weather. Yes. Uh, 300 days of sunshine a year. Yeah, we have snow on the ground right now, but it's plenty warm with the sun. Yeah, and and the other thing is, I was one of the first to go to altitude. Okay. Because my family had moved to Taos, New Mexico in the 60s, and I had run there in the summers and then gone back to school in the east yeah. to Yale and had found, and I, re I knew I could sense a benefit. Yeah. Before they were even talking about that and again the coincidence <laughs> I just happened to have as a coach someone who had been the 1964 Olympic Games coach okay and had actually been an assistant and been at Lake Tahoe with the athletes training for the Mexico City Games and the way he described it was yeah our athletes ran like crap in Mexico <laughs> But when they got home, yeah, they were superstars. Many of them set, set PRs. Yeah. So it was most likely that they were mentally, you know, affected by the altitude. But they'd actually trained. Yeah. And they retained that benefit after Mexico City. Gotcha. And so I knew, knowing that, and knowing, um, you know, how I felt, and also, you know, I've always, I think, <clears throat> again kind of reevaluated situations. For whatever reason, Boulder turned out to be the right altitude uh, at which to train before you reach the point of diminishing return mm -hmm. at altitude. Yeah. In other words, much higher, over 6,000 feet, it begins to shift. And I realized that because I had run intervals at 7,000 feet at Taos. Okay. This was, you know, 1970, 69. And I had actually, up at the ski valley, Taos Ski Valley, I had run at 9,000 to 10,000 feet. And I found, I realized there was no way I could do any kind of yeah. anaerobic training there. Yeah. And it was luck that Boulder in a way, is where it is. It, it, it's at the right, perf not perfect, but right yeah. altitude. Yeah. I think Boulder is, you know, in recent years, maybe taken, uh, you know, a little, taken on a little bit of a bad rap. Yeah. A rep. But I'll tell you, when I got here, the feeling in the early 70s in Boulder was, if you want to be good at what you're doing, whether it's mm -hmm. sports or business or academics, you were supported here. Yeah. Every subculture, if yeah. you want to look at it that mm -hmm. way, was treated equally and supported. Yep. And but, anyone within any of those subcultures could feel supported to try to do. Again, the sun, just like we have now, yeah. being able to live, or if you want to take your nice easy runs you just go out your door and yep. the only decision you have is do I do go left or right <laughs> I like that it's simple because yeah you can't go wrong in this area right here right so you know you're a prominent figure in Boulder and you're also pretty humble is it weird that you have for you to see a mural of you on the Broadway or the statue of you at the stadium yeah is that stuff I mean it's obviously it's a huge honor but I don't really I I honestly don't think about it I'm, yeah until it's brought up and, you know, for instance, <laughs> Sorry the for statue, bringing it up. <laughs> no, the statue was, you know, the donations were from my friends. Oh, uh, yeah, okay, so that means you a know, lot they, more. I think I've tried to always feel in any interaction like ours yeah. now is that, in essence, everyone's equal. Okay. We're all created equal. And I am flattered if someone wants to interact with me and you know ask me a question yeah and uh and i like to think that i don't give off the idea that i would rather be somewhere else yeah mm -hmm. and not doing it and it's not contrived yeah it's just the way yeah. i am Absolutely. now the anecdote that who sort of emotional that yeah. shows that when i was 1956, I was nine years old, mm -hmm. 
in this town in which I grew up. It was about 60 miles from New York City. And the 1956 Yankees, and I can name the entire team yeah. because people didn't shift teams. <laughs> but Mickey Mantle, yeah. who was the star, we got word. Somehow, Mickey Mantle's in a house down the street. Oh, wow. Four or five houses down. Okay. So we all got something for autographs. Wow. Went down, stood outside, waited for him to come out. He came out and blew us off. Oh, no. He walked right oh, by us. Your hearts were just crushed. And my thought was, I wasn't crushed. I, yeah. My reaction was, oh. <laughs> He's not because, as cool as I thought he was. <laughs> no, but the, but the other the other thing is, I knew that we had not done anything that deserved that. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and we were, um, and my thought was, in a way, you know, we're doing this. At least he could acknowledge the effort that he put in, and and again, kind of be flattered with the fact that. Yeah. He can be this icon. Yep. Um, wow. And and I think that always stayed with me. Yeah. And and so I I think that's part of it. Yeah. Is that I've been on the other side. Yeah. At a very impressionable age. Yep. Well, I have to bring up something right now, and you might not even remember, but growing up, you were one of my idols. I wanted to be an Olympian. I wanted to be a really fast runner. Um, but, you know, I was in a family with a single mom and four kids. We didn't sure. have a lot of money. And in high school, you gave me shoes. I don't remember that. Yeah, you gave me shoes. It was through Alex. He yeah. helped it all out, but you sure. gave me shoes because running shoes are very expensive. And so I'll forever be grateful for that yeah. act of uh, kindness. And, uh, yeah, but I, yeah, and again, I, I like to think that <laughs> I didn't, that I forgot it because for good reasons. Yeah, because it was just, you know, everyday well, things. You're just, that's who you are. And, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yep, and, uh, you know, Alex just <laughs> told me, and I said, yeah, sure. Yeah, I, know, it was, I will forever remember that, so well, thank you for that. You're welcome. It. Yeah. Now I get my own shoes. See which now, is great. now the payback is you. You st still pay attention to me when I'm old. And yeah, that's right. I sure do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and it makes me feel good. Now I help young right. people with bikes and shoes and whatever else right. I can, and you Absolutely. know you kind of pay it forward. So sure, of course you do. Yeah. Um, and it's also what it shows is if you're fortunate the way I was and you are now, mm -hmm. and I hope I can still be. You, you can be in situations where doing something like that for someone is really yeah. so easy. Yep. Um, and it's a good part of having notoriety. Yes. That, that you can do things for people that they couldn't do yep. for themselves. But for you, it's not a, it's not a huge effort. Yeah. Uh -huh. it, it just, it, of like, course you can. Yep. And, Oh, and it's a win-win for everybody. Sure, you know. But I like to think it's that's the way we are. Yeah, yeah, I, for I, sure. I think, but it can be, as I pointed out, it can be reinforced by certain experiences. Yes. Let's uh, change gears to new running shoes <coughs> and the Nike Vaporflies, which yeah. are kind of controversial. You kind know, of. the kind of yes, <laughs> or you know, the, the Kipchoge Marathon. What do you think about all this stuff going on in the world of running these days? Well, my wife Michelle, who is a very good swimmer and very good triathlon coach, and was a very good age group and still is age group triathlon. Yeah. She's had uh, under 19. Podium winners, okay. winners and podium <coughs> winners. Yeah. Uh, in the triathlon nationally. Yep. And she didn't skip a beat. Yeah. She saw that, and she said they're going to have to do exactly what the swimmers did with the suits. Ah. With the, and no one seems to think about that. Yeah. But she did. <laughs> it's and swimming was smart enough to uh, decide right away. It's such an obvious advantage. Yeah. And in a way, they didn't say, well, show us the statistics. Yeah. They really took the coaches and athletes' word for it. You see what I mean? Yeah. And, and yeah. again, it's with this idea of, you know, full life bans for drug users. Mm hmm. And if the advantage, I think the irony is, the 
advantages being held out as in the percentages. One, two, three, I think I've even heard four percent. Yeah. So in a way, <laughs> the way the pirates would put it, they're, they're being hoisted on their own petard <laughs> because they're, they're admitting to the advantage that has nothing to do with preparation yeah. that the shoe gives. Yeah. And I think just like with the blades, um, they're just going to have to be banned. Yeah. And, and, and until that happens, and the difficulty in parallel with the drug use is that the percentage of advantage that they're holding out is the same as taking a performance enhancing drug. Yeah, yeah, okay? yeah. And uh, that advantage simply cannot be overcome through training. Mm -hmm. Can't do it. Yep. And, and again, the irony is if you don't allow everyone to have the technology and hold true to the patent, uh, then you just can't have fair play yeah. in the event. Mm -hmm. It can't be a level playing field. Yeah. So I don't think they have any choice. Yeah, okay. Did you follow the sub two stuff? Did you <laughs> find that interesting? Do you think it's as amazing as most no. people do? No. No, okay. <laughs> That's what I figured you say. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. <clears throat> it, it, First thing I'll say, there was no drug test. Yeah, oh, uh, really? No. I don't think I knew that. Of course that. not. Of course. Well, I, I guess it was, yeah, it was, built, it was entertainment. It was billed as like a prize fight. Well, they didn't bill it as a competition. Yeah. They billed it as an attempt to break a record. Yeah. It, at least they didn't hold out that it was actually that's a competition. That's true. Yeah. So, you know, and again, that's, that's the way that stuff works. And... If you acknowledge the advantage and you're not with, willing to share it, yeah. then there's no choice. Yep. Do you have a proudest moment of it all? Can you look back and be like, that was the best of the best? And it can be away from running. It can be being a grandpa or whatever. What well, do you... I'll go with what just popped into my mind. Okay. And what popped into my mind was the day, the race, and the moment in a 10K race in Atlanta okay. that Alex and I started out together. Uh, okay. And we got to about four miles and he started to run away from me. <laughs> and I was trying and you to couldn't keep hold, up. couldn't keep up. And I couldn't keep up <laughs> and I knew it and it wasn't even articulated. Yeah. It's just he took off and, um, you know, he, and he found his own yep. way in running. And for him, it's something he still does. Absolutely. But it was never the primary thing. Yeah. And he was much more of an academician. Yep. And, um, you know, took that route. Yeah, absolutely. So now he's a PhD professor, and that's certainly fine with me. Oh, he's incredible. Yeah. And he's still one of my best friends. And I usually... I run solo. I don't really have a running partner, but when Alex comes back to town, yeah. we run together. He's right. like my only solid running partner I've had throughout my whole life. So That's right. Do you think training has changed much from the days of when you were winning races to now? Well, that brings up another question, I yeah. think. From the mid-70s until the first part of this century, uh, a lot of the improvement was due to drugs. Yes. And, but I think what happened, my own personal theory, yeah. is that oh, between, say, 1975 and 2000, training became more elaborate and you had to do more, what I call, ancillary things. Yep. Uh, bounding certain exercises. And this was sort of held out as, you know, this is the reason. Yeah. Well, they had to somehow explain this ex exponential improvement in yeah. time that was brought on by the drugs. Yep. And so they, they added to the training routine so they could say, see? Yeah. That, that's why everyone's improving yeah, like, like this. Oh, that's weird. You know, so the next Olympics, you get second place to a guy from East Germany who it turns out was um, convicted of um, using performance enhancing drugs. And I think... 
from my, my understanding, it you know motivates you to get involved, and you are one of the founding members right. of the anti-doping agency. Um, you know, where are we at now with drugs? Because it seems like, you know, the Russian team just got busted again. It's like, are we ever going to move away from this stuff? Well, it has to come from the top. Yeah. The U.S. anti-doping could be established because President Bill Clinton had a drug czar named Barry McCaffrey, okay. who had been the commander of the first Gulf War, and he wanted to do something. Yeah. And so you had White House support. And as little is known... Um, but I, I've decided I can finally talk about it. It's been yeah. so long. Uh, John McCain was instrumental. Oh, it, wow. was, it was a bipartisan effort. And he, through the Commerce Committee, when we worked to come up with an outline that became USADA. Okay. In other words, the outline that it would be totally independent and, yep. and everything else about it. And... It would be funded by the government and by the USOC. McCain called Commerce Committee hearings before uh, USADA was, you know, ratified. Wow. And we all went and I testified at those hearings and other people did. Yep. And, you know, everybody went home thinking, well, nothing will happen. Yeah. Because the... Uh, Nothing will happen because the IOC doesn't answer to anybody. There's no leverage against the IOC. Yeah. Right? Well, that's what they thought. <laughs> Barry McCaffrey, in early 99, calls over Juan Antonio Samaranch, who comes to Washington. They sit down. He hands him the outline of what became USADA. And he said... This is an agency yeah. that's going to be formed by the U.S. Olympic Committee. And they're going to come up with the idea. Yep. This idea. Yeah. And they can have their task force and spend their time deciding this is what they're going to do. And they can take credit for it. You know, they can yeah. uh, claim that they you know, had this idea wow. and they're going to fund it and we in the government of the United States will also fund half of it and if this doesn't happen by the start by between if this agency does not take over right after the Sydney Games which was in 2000 the International Olympic Committee through Barry McCaffrey's Commerce Committee yeah will lose their tax-exempt status for all income from the Salt Lake City Games. Wow. That's quite a threat. Yep. <laughs> that's that's quite happened. a threat. Wow, okay. That's how, that's how USADA happened. Yeah, wow. The outline of USADA, to answer your question, if Thomas Bach, the head of the IOC, decided to basically implement and basically clone USADA and tell every athletic federation, National Olympic Committee in the world that they had to do this and actually do it. Yeah. The problem would, would be solved. Well, or it'd, be, it'd become close. Yeah. Instead, you have the World Anti-Doping Agency, which whose outgoing president is also coincidentally on the executive board of the International Olympic Committee. Uh -huh. So there's no conflict of interest. Yeah, not at all. Not, Doesn't not, sound like no, it. No, no. <laughs> sort of like U.S. politics. Yeah. And hi there. Hello. Hello. Hi, buddy. How are you doing? Oh, you look sweet. Hi there. Interesting cross. Yeah. <laughs> and, and just to comment on the Russian yeah. expulsion, it's a, it's, a, basically the same thing they did in 2016. Yeah. But they've actually done it better this time. You know, <laughs> Travis Tigert from USADA, who's responsible for, you know, the Lance Armstrong and Alberto Salazar yeah. disqualifications, he pointed out that here you have people who are being banned for tampering with and destroying evidence. Yep. 
And so therefore, many of their athletes, and most likely their superior athletes, were not and will never be able to be found yeah, guilty. guilty. Yep. And this is the talent pool that can now qualify because they've done nothing yeah. for the next games. Uh, okay? Yeah. It, it's like... Yeah, it's so frustrating. <laughs> okay? <laughs> yeah. And, and they don't have to do it. Yeah. Now, the other thing to get uh, another aspect of it is Travis Taggart is also, he's right. And other athletes, clean athletes, have said, look, bands have to be permanent. Yeah. Because what is not ever talked about is the fact, not a, no, it's not a fact, but the research is starting to show that if you're on drugs for a significant period of time, performance enhancing, yeah. and you gain certain benefits, even if you go off those drugs, and then go on a profile program and are tested yeah. and don't test positive, you never revert back uh, wow. to the point you were when you started taking them. Huh, that's fascinating. So the athletes, an athlete who gets banned and then penalized, when that athlete comes back, they come back, even if they're clean at that point, yep. having gained an advantage that they never lose. Wow. All right? I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Huh. Well, it's sort of like they haven't gotten that interested in it, and the science is just starting to come out. And as with all these kinds of arguments, it's, well, show me the science. <laughs> and the problem with it is you can't do a double-blind empirical study. Yeah putting people on drugs for four years and yeah. some not on drugs and then taking them off yeah. and then seeing how much of it they retained. You see what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't yeah. lend itself no. to empirical verification. Huh. But any athlete will tell you, <laughs> yeah. any athlete who's been there will tell you. Yeah. They're, wow. So you think if somebody's banned, they should be banned for life. Yes. It's just not fair that they ever come back. No. Okay. No. Wow. No. Yeah. I really appreciate you spending some time with me today. Oh, yeah. I know people are going to love this. Anytime. And uh, thank you again for everything you've done for, for me in the past and creating the Boulder Boulder, my favorite day of the year. <laughs> and uh, I will put some links in the video to some of the amazing articles about Frank. He wrote a book called My Marathon. I'll put a link to that in there if you want to learn more about Frank. But uh, thank you so much. Sure. Thank yeah. you.